सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली एग्जीक्यूशन ऑफ अनदर ऑफ शेख मुजीबुर रहमान एसिस्टेंस दिस इज कैप्टन अब्दुल मजीद हु वॉज अरेस्टेड इन ढाका जस्ट द अदर डे लुक्स लाइक he told uh, bangladeshi authorities that he had been hiding in india and in kolkata for a long time and then quickly he was executed because he was carrying a death sentence on his head since 2009 had been a fugitive since then now besides the fact that looks to pat uh, to which i will come later let's reconstruct for you what happened because these are events of 15th august 1975 Indian Independence Day 1975 the events took place in Dhaka essentially at the Dhan Mandi Mandi residence of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman but also the army headquarters couple of other places and couple of other residences in the better of parts of uh, or what you might call the Latians equivalent of uh, Dhaka now let me take you back before i re- reconstruct the events for you let me take you back to the times 1975 was a long time back uh, most of you were not born in 1975 uh, it was 45 years back uh, i was just about 18 at that point now go to the summer of 1975 by that time economic situation in india and political situation in india is very unstable our inflation is at 30% because india is a post war economy in fact the entire subcontinent is a post war economy it's a post 1971 war economy but it's also an economy that is reeling under the oil shock because 1973 the yom kippur war came and that's when the oil producing country, countries combined and catalyzed and decided to up the oil prices so these very poor countries which had just been just faced war were reeling from that india had political instability also mrs gandhi had been unseated by the allahabad high court she had a very uneasy stay from supreme court bhutto in pakistan had his own struggle she had to deal with a country which had broken up uh, so everything was up in the air this is also a period when cold war was at its peak all over the world and remember as we come into 1975 we are still also under the influence of the assassination in chile far away chile of popular president salvador allende and his replacement by pinochet that was proven to be a cia operation and that led many of these other leaders particularly those who were seen to be not pro american and who were seen to be of the left or socialists to fear that the same specter now hung on their heads as well in fact indira gandhi used that uh, in the discourse at that point as a piece of evidence to say look there are big powers who are targeting us now i now take you to june of 2000 uh, uh, to, of 1975 june 14 of 1975 by this time situation in bangladesh had become really bad because bangladesh had had really been destroyed by pakistani army by the occupation uh, nearly a crore of its population at that point which must have been more than 10% maybe 15% of its population had gone as refugees to india they were coming back the country had been devastated lots of people were killed children were killed hundreds of thousands of women were of women were raped this was truly a very poor country very poor part of a very poor country that was pakistan and then suffered greatly during that war now that country had its own struggles and the awami league which came to power because sheikh mujibur rahman was the founder and chief of awami league 
that was trying to put things together. Awami League was a left wing socialist party, but a left wing socialist party, not really a dictatorial party. Now, another left wing element of Awami League broke away and they converted themselves into some kind of a uh, insurgent movement. These were younger people. Uh, so these, young, uh, these younger people then started some kind of uh, activity, some kind of insurgent activity uh, against the Mujib government. Now, this, uh, this group was called Gono Bahini. Uh, Gono means people uh, in Bengali. So Gono Bahini, they were carrying out this insurgent activity. Now, Sheikh Mujib got more hassled, more panicky, and there was a sense of emergency in the country. So, think about it. 14th of June, 1975, Bangladesh, under Sheikh Mujib Rahman, imposed what could be called its own version of the emergency. Indian emergency came a fortnight later. And how did this happen? Sheikh Mujib's government passed the Fourth Amendment, he was the president then, Fourth Amendment uh, or inserted Article 17A to the Constitution. This was June 7, uh, I apologize, not June 14, so Indian emergency came three weeks later. June 7, he set up a new national party called Baksal, that is Bangladesh Krishak Shramik Awami League. So Awami League lead, uh, morphed into Baksal, but it abolished all other political parties and took away all press freedom, etc., etc. So this became like a communist party rule in a classical communist country, uh, much on the East European format. That led to problems, and this government itself was also no uh, no uh, perfect government. There were many excesses committed under this government, and disaffection was rising in the country. That is the time when a bunch of Bangladesh army officers got together and decided to do something about it. Now, the names I will mention to you, major, these are all majors. That's why it was called the coup of the majors at that point. Major Syed, uh, Syed Farooq Rahman, uh, Khandakar Abdul Rashid, Shariful Haq Dalim, Moinuddin Ahmed, E.K. Moinuddin Ahmed, there were two of them. Bazlul Huda, SHMB, Noor Chaudhary, they all got together and they started talking and saying, look, Bangladesh can't carry on like this, we'll be destroyed, if at all we'll become slaves of India, so we have to do something about it. So they went to Major General Ziaur Rahman then, he wasn't the chief, he was number two in the army and said we need to do something about it. Looks like they had his blessings and they organized this coup and assassination against Sheikh Mujib and his family. Now, what happened on the day of the assassination? They chose on the 12th of August was Colonel uh, Major Farooq's wedding anniversary. He had a party at his home. As the wedding anniversary party ended around 12.30 a.m., they decided that the date of the coup and the assassinations was going to be the 15th. In fact, they were not quite sure they were going to assassinate Mujibur Rahman. Their idea was, we'll go there, we will ask him to abrogate all the changes he had made to the constitution, resign, offer himself for arrest, we'll take him to the cantonment and keep him there. We need not kill him. But if he refuses to resign and offer himself for arrest, we should be open to assassinating him. And as these things end, they always end with the worst case scenario. So they end, ended up assassinating him. So what happened that day on the 15th? These army officers, all majors, one odd colonel, several captains, couple of risaldars, the key elements of these came from the armored corps, from 1st armored division, the Bengal Lancers Regiment, an old famous armor cavalry regiment of Bangladesh army. They got together and broke themselves, divided themselves into four groups. One group went to Sheikh Mujib's house. One group, the larger group, went out to see if troops loyal to Sheikh Mujib were going to fight back. A regiment of the artillery was summoned to direct fire at the headquarters of the army unit that was personally loyal to Sheikh Mujib in case he acted funny. Another group 
headed the tank corps so there were tanks available there a third group went to another brother in law's sheikh uh, sheikh mujib brother in law's house and another one went to his nephew's house and then you see what happened now sheikh kamal that is sheikh mujib's son he was killed at the reception area on the ground floor of his house so that was done very quickly number 2 uh, when sheikh mujib saw this he summoned his chief of military intelligence colonel jamiluddin to come and restore order so he came and he shouted at these officers not to do this they shot him so he was the next one dead then they went up uh, they killed sheikh mujib's wife that is sheikh fazila tunisa mujib they killed his younger brother sheikh nasir they killed his younger son sheikh jamil the first one they had killed at the reception area sheikh kamal sheikh uh, jamal they killed later sheikh mujib refused to surrender and withdraw his orders and abdicate and offer himself for arrest so he was shot also sheikh mujib's youngest son sheikh rasel if i remember correctly he was a child if i remember correctly he was just about 10 or something he was killed sheikh mujib's two daughters in law were also killed and so were the families of his brothers and many guards many of them had hidden themselves inside the toilets so these guys broke into the toilets and killed them all now two other groups went to other areas one went to the house of sheikh mujib's nephew uh, sheikh fazlul fazlul haq mani who was also an awami league uh, office bearer they killed him and his pregnant wife uh, arzu moni if i remember correctly then another group went to the house of abdul rab sarniyabat who was a brother in law of sheikh mujib that group killed him and several members of his family so basically the idea was that nobody around sheikh mujib should survive it does seem that this captain abdul majid who's just been executed he was in the group that went to abdul rab sarniyabat's house but he was essential to the main conspiracy because he is the one who not only was a kingpin but who, who had also taken out weapons from the bengal lancers armory and later had publicly boasted that he was responsible in fact he had never denied the fact uh, that he he was responsible for the assassination of sheikh mujib it's just that he was among those many people who were hiding of the 20 allegedly involved then and put to trial 15 were convicted uh, by the trial court uh, the high court acquitted five of them the supreme court changed that decision so supreme court conduct, convicted 12 they let three get away many of these went into exile in fact when the new government came in after uh, sheikh mujib's death and i will tell you a little bit it's very complicated about what happened uh, they first of all passed an indemnity ordinance which said that none of these officers they all had indemnity for what they had done earlier so within months of the assassination uh, the the successor president khondakar mushtaq ahmed he issued an indemnity ordinance which later zia ur rahman's government ratified so these people were safe till then they were given foreign postings sent to bangladesh missions here and there many of them settled overseas some never surfaced but later as trial after trial as it happens in the subcontinent date after date after date and in many changes took place in bangladesh in 1996 sheikh hasina came back uh, and she repealed the earlier indemnity law that the martial law dictators had passed once that happened trial started in 2010 january five of these ex- uh, these convicts were executed and the government was searching for the rest of them so this abdul majid is from among the rest of them so that is the story of the assassination then what happens after assassination bangladesh in fact has had a much tougher history of military coups and takeovers and toppling of governments than pakistan because pakistan is a strange country it's a unique country in the world where every coup has been peaceful it's as if everybody is waiting for a coup nobody needs to be assassinated at the time of the coup later the guy you replace in a coup 
will always be either jailed, exiled, assassinated or all three. But nobody is to fire a bullet in Pakistan to take over. In this case, these people took over after killing Mujib Rahman, his family. Not just that, four key leaders of his party that, uh, were also arrested and locked up in jail immediately. Uh, as that happened, you knew that uh, Awami League was left with no leadership. And to leave nothing to chance, after killing Sheikh Mujib's entire family, they also took Tajuddin Ahmed, former Prime Minister, Mansoor Ali, also former Prime Minister, former Vice President Sayyid Nazrul Islam, uh, former Home Minister Kamru Zaman, all of them were arrested and they were locked up in jail. Later, on 3rd of November, they were assassinated inside the jail. In that also, this Abdul Majid was supposedly involved. He was given a life sentence for those murders as well. So, not a nice guy at all. Now, uh, what happened after Mujib died? After Mujib died, one of these officers, as we told you, has the name Khandakar uh, something. Now, he had a close relation, Khandakar Mushtaq Ahmad, who was then Commerce Minister. And he said that once Sheikh Mujib is out of the, the way, we will make him in charge of the administration. So, Khandakar Mushtaq Ahmad was made in charge of the administration. But there were other people in uh, uh, Bangladesh, they were patriots and these, these were people who had fought in the freedom movement, who did not like this. And one of them was a Brigadier Khalid Musharraf. The Brigadier Khalid Musharraf was one of the heroes of the 1971 Mukti Bahini freedom movement. Uh, he had been the most among the most decorated soldiers on the Bangladeshi side at that point. He was also a decent soldier. He was also a loyalist of the Mujib family and he did not like what was going on. He was in a brigadier, brigadier general staff in the army headquarters. So, he did go to Zia and said, look, the entire army's system has been upset. These officers were involved in Mujib's assassination. You do something about them. Zia did nothing, obviously, because Zia was hand in glove with them. And the new president, one of the first things he did was to then elevate Zia as the army chief, although Zia was number one. This is Ziaur Rahman. Uh, he was number two, so he was made the chief of army staff. So, out of frustration and around time on the third, these other Awami League leaders were assassinated in the jail. Brigadier Khalid carried out a little coup of his own, removed Khandakar Mushtaq Ahmad and took over power. He did not declare himself anything, he took over power. He was in charge of the country, but it lasted only four days. His idea was not to continue to be in power. His idea was to maybe take the help of a good general or somebody to restore some semblance of order in Bangladesh and to bring in a regular legitimate government. But he wasn't allowed to be because for General Zia Rahman, stakes were very high. <clears throat> so, uh, within four days, November 7, he had gone along with a couple of other friends of his, also army officers, to the house of yet another army officer, a close friend of theirs. They were assassinated there and they were killed. So, this was the cycle of assassinations after which Ziaur Rahman took over. So, as I had said to you in Kattak letter, episode 212, <coughs> there, was a, there was a period now when India had Zia's on both sides. Zia ul Haq from 1978 uh, onwards in Pakistan and now Zia ur Rahman in Bangladesh already. So, India had these two generals in charge of the two countries that had come out as a result of Pakistan's vivisection, uh, dismemberment and it looked like India had a double problem and all the gains of the war in Bangla uh, over Bangladesh had now been frittered away. Mrs. Gandhi always saw it as a conspiracy, as the part of a larger conspiracy that and she obviously blamed the Americans for it because this was then the peak of the Cold War and the Americans and the CIA were then working together 
with many other forces and local elements to try and bring down the regimes or governments they did not like. In fact, there is a book by Lawrence Lifshultz on that period, or uh, Laurie Lifshultz as it's, as, as it's called, uh, Bangladesh, the Unfinished Revolution, in which he hints, more than hints, he uh, insinuates quite strongly that CIA was involved in Mujib's assassination. So Mrs. Gandhi, for a long time, and her supporters said that, look, this was going to happen to her also. And that's why she had to impose the emergency. I mean, all of us think, most of us think it was a fake excuse. And the Congress party itself has stopped defending it for a very long time now. So whatever it was, a period of instability began. Zia Rahman came in, 81. He was also assassinated. So in fact, his wife, Khalida Zia, also joined politics. Now, when the kid destroyed Mujibur Rahman's family, the idea was to kill every member of his family, including a child, but or many children in the family. But what they could not help was the fact that two of his daughters survived because they were in West Germany. Sheikh Hasina was among them. So they came back to Delhi and sought refuge in Delhi. So Sheikh Hasina also went back and built her father's politics. Khalida Zia built politics after her assassinated husband. So one widow and one daughter of an assassinated, not just father, but also mother, uncles, brothers, everybody, uh, sisters-in-law, nephews, nieces, they got together and they in a way collaborated to get rid of the dictatorship in Bangladesh. It so happens now that willy-nilly, Bangladesh is back to having a kind of dictatorship, although it's an elected dictatorship. It's the closest you can get to a dictatorship after having been elected through the ballot. That is Sheikh Hasina's government. So this, the execution of this man closes, closes one more chapter in that big epic beginning in 1975. It's not over yet because a few people are still here and there. Several of the old jamaat islami people who were involved, convicted, charged with carrying out massive massacres and atrocities during 1971 are also hiding here and there. A couple of them in Pakistan. I think it's a in the course of time, reckoning will catch up with them also. So this, I thought, was a very important thing to talk about today and also to take you back to a very tumultuous period in the subcontinent. His